How are the query key and value calculated in machine learning when we are using it as self-intention input for a transformer model? Well, guess what? It might be a surprise to you, even though they are three different variables with some pretty significantly different names, query, key, and value, it turns out they're all the same. That's right, isn't that crazy? Each of these variables are identical. You would think that they wouldn't be. You would think maybe we would, why name them differently? That's actually a really good question. However, the good news is from a simplicity perspective, all you have to know is that Q, Q here, K, and B, they're the same. They're all, they're identical, that's crazy. And uh, they are all derived through the input embedding. So you see here, we've got the query on the left, the key in the middle, and the value on the right. And they are just copies of the same output from the embedding layer. In a YouTube comment from SamKit asking that is V in QKV query key value doesn't need any positional encodings. Well, it turns out that Q, K, and V are all identical copies of the output from an embedding layer. And before you input this data into a transformer model, the self-attention, you could apply uh, positional encodings into query key and value, all of them at the same time. Sometimes you don't need to apply a positional encoding to one of these, depending on your use case. Really, it depends on what you want the model to see. What you're basically picking what the model sees, what you want it to attend to, and then what the model is gonna respond with. That's the whole idea of, of behind the transformer model, being able to see self-attention, right? So you start with a string of words, you tokenize into a number, right? Representing each token, it's like a dictionary ID lookup. Then you throw that number into an embedding. Typically, these things are combined because the embedding is going to be represented by the dictionary ID element when it outputs a uh, multi-dimensional vector that's going to represent each token, which each word in that case. And it has essentially properties of every single word that you provide it. It's gonna provide uh, property values. Um, in that case, there's a bunch of floating point numbers, right? A whole bunch of floating point numbers, but you're gonna get an entire array, a single dimensional array for every single token. And that is the embedding process. And that is where Q, K, and V are calculated. They are copies of this data. Now, before you put it into the intention model, right? The attention me mechanism, you can self uh, you can you can positionally encode Q and K uh, and V too if you wanted before the self attention is calculated in the transformer model which is you know phase one there's actually a phase ahead of that which is data preparation now say for example we have a simple sentence right and we say the simple sentence here is this is a simple text or sample text right smapple <laughs> I like that misspelling right there. We've got a Smapple text, right? So each word here is essentially a token. What is going to happen is we, let's actually walk through it step by step. Let's, let's just do this really simple art. So we've got an uh, input sequence here, a very simple input sequence. So we'll just say the quick brown fox. That's the sentence. Very simple, very simple sentence. All right. Then we tokenize that, right? So we split every single word and symbol into uh, a token and then that token is going to be converted into a dictionary value of an ID that's represented in the word embeddings model, usually like word to back, right? So we'll have a word to back model. And this will, so we've input like say 200, right? That could be the ID of the, the word the, right? For the quick brown fox, it gets converted to 200 and then that 200 gets put into a word embedding which is another machine learning model that has representations of relationships between all the words in the world or in one language, depending on which vector, uh, word vector you're using. And that outputs uh, a, a single dimensional array for every single token. And this array could be very big, right? So it could be 512, which is a lot, 512 floating point numbers for every single word. That's a lot of, that's a lot of floating point numbers per word. Essentially every single floating point number is an attribute of that word in its relationships to all the other words in, uh, in your dictionary. Then you get the output of uh, the word to vec. And guess what? This is where the query key and value are copied. So we have our query key and value created at this point. 
So this is the point where query key value are created. You just copy the output of the word embeddings and they're the same. They're all the same. It's exactly the same, right? So you've got your input sequence, the output from the embedding then gets copied. Now you can go into a linear activation beyond that, which is going to be your positional encodings and sort of that normalization or write the activation function. All right, so we have the output from our word embeddings. In this case, it's going to be like a nice tasty matrix that we're going to copy three times for the query key and value. They're going to be essentially duplications of the embedding from the output of the word embeddings, like word to vec. Next, we're going to calculate positional encodings, which looks like this. It's sort of a, a repeating pattern of a frequency based on the total probability input length, right? And so at the beginning, based on the position, you're going to say position one is going to receive a value of one in the positional encoding. Position two is going to receive here, right? Because it's going to be for every single token, essentially, is you're going to be able to calculate a dedicated floating point number, right? This is just going to be one value, a floating point number value. Uh, based on its position and the rotation of the number of columns. Every single column is going to be a token and based on its position in the token and the number of the number of uh, rotations that you have, right? How many sine or cosine waves do you want? You'll notice that the amplitude is identical across all, always goes to one to negative one. This is the normalization or the activation aspect. And then for every nth number you'll rotate through the number of uh the number of total fre uh, frequencies that you have here all right so your frequency increases as you go on and increase into the number of tokens that you have and you can you can vary this however you want right so you can have it span the entire input length or you can have it rotate for every fourth character, it always chooses, you know, one of these values. So you could have it positioned based on its total position in the arc. It's just so many options. There's no tried and true way that goes into this. The positional encoding can be done in a lot of different ways. Now this is all done before we even get to the attention mechanism of the machine learning model for transformers. So now we've calculated our positional encodings. And what we want to do next is take that and add that to our query key and value. We have our output from our embedding layer, which is, you know, a series of floating point numbers and single dimensional arrays representing every single token. And we will take output from a cosine function based on the position of the token is, right? So the position uh, the is at the very first position. The next position is the token quick, right? And so the third is brown and the fourth is fox. We have our positions uh, and this is how those are calculated. We're going to uh, simply enrich our embeddings by applying a positional adjustment to every single token. Now, what you can do is for the query key and value, you can do, you can es essentially uh, take your enrichment values, multi uh, add them together, um, and then take the original word uh, output, the word embedding output, and then multiply the enrichments directly to them. And you're going to get the same across the board. It's just going to be, they're still going to keep them the same. These are still the same values, unless you choose to have the value or any other one of these to have a different activation or sort of a, that normalization function applied to it. Really depends depends on what you're looking to build and what you want the model to. What are you showing the model? This is the data that you're going to be giving to the model before um, anything happens, right? And so you want to be sure that you're giving the model the data that you think is the most important to pay attention to. And then it's going to be related to the output of that. So you want to make sure that the model has as much information that is necessary in order to best predict the output before we even get to the attention mechanism, right? So this is all the preparation of the data, we haven't even gotten into the transformer model yet. Now we finally made it to the beginning of the model, the transformer model, the self-attention aspect, right? We need to self-attend to the data that we're providing the model. And guess what? This is where the model really starts. At the beginning of the model, the, the scaled dot product, it's self-attention essentially. And here's where the self part comes in. Q, K, and B are all identical. They are 
the words of the input data that have been transformed into an embedding layer that provides sort of relationship data between um, each of the words. Now, the embedding model is a pre-trained model that sort of detects relationships between all the words and is able to provide a multi-dimensional output of the properties of every single word, right? Every single word in this case is a token, and that token is then transformed into an array. Could be 512 floating point numbers representing details about a word, like the word fox, for example, is an animal and it's a noun, and that data is inside of the embedding as floating point numbers. So Q, K, and B will be then self-attended. We're going to multiply our matrix, creating a correlation coefficient between Q, K, and B. Isn't that crazy? All right, so we've got Q, K, and B, all the same data. We start with Q here. We're going to do the add norm. Q is going to be the first matrix, un unchanged. It's just going to be what you, it's going to be the output, right? That's also positionally encoded. Then you take K, you transpose that, right? So you're going to tilt it and just base Basically, that's the, um, it's the same data, it's just that you've rotated the matrix. Then you multiply it, which is going to, um, okay, so then, right, okay, here we have the QK, multiply those together, then we're gonna scale it uh, based on the number of tokens in input sequence, and then we're going to multiply it with V. So Q, K, and V, right? All the of course, don't forget the softmax, right? This is a, another activation. So essentially, this is the self-attention part, the scale dot product, uh, and it's going to self-attend. And then we've got the output uh, through matrix multiplication. And this is so crazy. It, it's it's like sim a simplified here, right? We got a little bit of simplified where we are doing just one head. This is not multi-headed example. This is just representing just a simple uh, single-headed attention. Now you can do multi-headed attention as well. And that is very simply just taking the dimensions of the output and then splitting the dimensions and then comparing those dimensions to each other from the other words. So it's just like you're essentially splitting the properties across multiple parallel cores. So you can uh, you can train a model more quickly or you can prepare the data as input into the model from the attention factor more quickly because this is the parallelization step, the output from the embedding model might have 512 uh, features, right? Dimensions, and then you take those 512 dimensions if you split it into four heads for multi-headed attention, and now you have 128 features that you're comparing in the attention mechanism. One of the questions I had when looking at the multi-headed attention aspect for the transformer model is what does it look like when you have more than one head, right? What, it, what does that even mean? Because you've got the query key and value, which is the output of the vectorization from the embedding layer, that data is copied between Q, K, and V, so it's all the same, then what does it mean to split those? How do you split that data? Well, it turns out it's really straightforward. You're just splitting the features that are represented from the embedding layer. The embedding layer might give you 512 features for every single word, right? That's a lot of features, right? That's just a lot of information uh, to matrix multiply. So say we have here one sentence, and that sentence has 10 words in that sentence. Every word will have 512 features, right? So kind of zoom in here a little bit. So we've got 512 features, which is 512 floating point numbers. So that's a lot of floating point numbers uh, that you know we could split into four, and then it looks like we've got now sort of transpo. We got a different kind of matrix, uh, multi-dimensional matrix. So now we've got a four-dimensional matrix. This one really is the representation of a batch. How many uh, batches are we going to be leveraging? In this case, like one input sequence. Just keep it simple, right? Um, and now we've split this into four, and we still have 10, uh, 10 tokens. Uh, but in this case, since we split it in 512 into four, we're taking every single segment of the properties that are outputted from the embedding layer, and then we're going to attend on those properties in a parallelization step. This helps accelerate the model and helps essentially make the model more performant overall. This is a way to improve the training speed and the inference time in general on how, how we go about this. So you'd wanna split based on the number of parallelizations that you can have in a system. So if you have eight GPUs, you'd wanna split this into eight heads, for example. Uh, that would work out really well. Uh, you could you could do that in uh, other ways. You could, Maybe you wanna do this all in the CPU world and you've got 100 CPUs, right? So you could split it even further. You do want it to be representative of a, uh, we don't want any remainder values. We want whole numbers. Uh, so it's gonna to have to be be divisible 
uh, without any remainders. Entirely depends on your embedding layer on uh, what, how, what the dimensions are of your embedding layer.